Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to iSelect's Industry Overview Webinar Series. My name is Tom Bunn. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to walk you through today's presentation, our panelists, and hopefully what will be a, a nice interactive discussion. For those new to these webinars, iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis, Missouri, focused primarily on early stage companies in healthcare and agriculture and food. At iSelect, we are privileged to live at the forefront of innovation, seeing emerging problems, solutions, and macro trends at their beginning before they make their way into popular culture. We use these deep dive presentations not only as a way for us to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also to engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who are driving change and innovation in their respective fields. One such topic that we're very interested in of, of late is the, the shift to value-based care. While this is not a new topic, we thought this would be a, a good time given the underlying changes in the healthcare system over the past few years to take a look at it and to get a panel together to help us dissect what's going on. So a few process comments, we are not soliciting investment or giving investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. Secondly, we have invited you to this because you are technologists, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, industry experts, early adopter customers, or sophisticated investors that are part of the iSelect network. We value your thoughts, questions, comments, and insights into this topic, and would greatly appreciate it if you actively engage during the presentation. If you do have a comment or question during the call, feel free to just raise your hand and we can unmute you. I believe there are a couple other folks on panelists who likewise feel free to, to jump in and comment as you feel fit. Thirdly, we ask that you put yourself on mute for the time being. However, again, we hope for this to be an engaging and interactive presentation. So if you do have questions or comments, please feel free to, to do those. And we will have some time at the end where I will open it up for broader Q&A with the, the rest of the uh, attendees. And finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So with that, I'm pleased to bring you this week's topic on value-based care. So a quick guidepost roadmap of what we're gonna be doing today. We have four great speakers, four great entrepreneurs with us today. I will ask them to introduce themselves briefly. And then I will try to set the stage for what will be a good panel discussion among our stakeholders here. The background will be kind of the, the need for value-based care, what it is, Obviously, there's much detail that you can go into in this very complicated realm with many acronyms and a lot of legislative jargon, but we're taking a, what I like to call a practical tact to, to the discussion today. Most of it will be around those in the market working towards solutions in a, in a more value-based way in the healthcare industry. And finally, we will have some time for Q&A. And again, I invite the entire Zoom call to, to participate in that and, and uh, hopefully it will be dynamic. So with that, I would like to introduce our guests. Why don't we just go left to right as I'm seeing them. Dr. Dave Amon, would you give a, a brief bio, please? Sure. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, everyone, for the, the opportunity to be here today and participate in the panel. So a little of my background. I am currently the CEO of a company called Privis Health, which has got its corporate headquarters in the Raleigh-Durham area of North Carolina. We have a distributed workforce of uh, roughly 40 FTEs all across the country. I myself am today headquartered and located in Greenville, South Carolina, which is where my full-time home is. My journey to Privis Health has been, been a long one and not always a linear path uh, as I have professionally chased how do we do something better for healthcare and better for patients over the course of my career? To take a little step back here, I actually started my uh, professional life as an engineer on active duty in the U.S. Air Force. After about seven years working on spacecraft systems, I realized I enjoyed the life sciences more than drawings and schematics. And so I migrated into medical school, I practiced emergency medicine, in pediatric emergency medicine and still do just a couple days a month now. But about six, seven years ago, I, 
I began to realize uh, a little, probably late to the game because I was so steeped in my clinical work that, that most of what I was seeing coming through the emergency department need, didn't need to be there. 80% of the patients I was taking care of were failures of the system. It wasn't that they were non-compliant or that they weren't going after the care they needed. They didn't have access to it. And being the engineer at heart, I, I set about to tinker with the system and see what needed to be done to change that. I came to the conclusion that that really what drives healthcare, and I think we can all realize this, this is not this is not an epiphany to anyone. That uh, healthcare and what we do in healthcare is largely driven by finance and where the money is. And so, in a fee for service environment, if you incentivize volume, that's exactly what you get. You can drive a lot of strange and what I would view as even perverse behaviors within healthcare and in any industry by doing exactly that. So I came to the conclusion that I needed to take a step back. I took a sabbatical for 18 months, I picked up a business degree, really thinking about how we change the flow of money within healthcare. And we moved the cheese for, for the mice. And we, we actually set about to put the patient at the center of the experience, drive wellness, drive prevention, and change the financial models that both the payers and providers currently work under. That journey took me post-graduation from business school up to work as an ACO, Accountable Care Organization Medical Director and a Chief Health Officer for a very progressive rural health system in New Hampshire, North Country Healthcare. I was there for a couple of years, had tremendous success in the, the Accountable Care Organization with a fairly small panel of Medicare patients, roughly 11,500. The number one performing rural ACO out of about 28 or 29 in the country at the time. And uh, really we did it with a lot of hard work and without the proper tools. So when that activity wound down for me, I literally went off into the world in search of the tools that we did not have. You can call those population health platforms, technology, all kinds of things. Insight into patient risks, risk stratification techniques, things using AI. That, that really landed me at Privis, which is a company that about 18 months ago was, was in, in need of some strategic reorganization and in thinking about the future of healthcare. So I had an invitation to join Privis. I now have a very nice canvas to paint on in terms of achieving all those objectives. And it's been a great ride for the last 18 months that I've been at the company. And uh, we've achieved a lot of success over the last 12 months. And I think it's because we're, we're speaking the right language to our customers. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, and thank you, Tom. Great. Thanks, Dave. Excited to, to dive into what that language is. Uh, I think it's an interesting tact you're taking. So we'll get there in a few. Vishal, would you mind giving a, a brief bio, please? Well, thank you for the invite. Dr. Dave, I'm already a fan. So my background is a little also non-traditional and not, a, not linear. I come from the hospitality business. In a nutshell, I worked in India, in the UK, Canada, Egypt, St. Lucia, then the Caribbean role, and then now back here. I also joined healthcare because of a, what we call a crucible moment uh, or event in our family. My dad, for the last two years of his life, was in a hospital, and they took great care of him, but he had some unintended consequences. At that time, I happened to be doing my MBA, and after he passed on, I decided to serve in healthcare. And I started off as the chief experience officer at Parkland Health and Hospital System, which is a county health and hospital system in Dallas. I'm still there, actually. I started Atrium on Monday. And in a nutshell, Parkland has the busiest emergency room in the country. We are uh, the entire continuum of care from, from your family physician. And so we have 80 clinics. We also have five buses that care for the homeless. We have 29 nursing homes. We care for the jail health population and about a thousand bed hospital plus or minus. We got into a brand new facility in 2015, and we were still in the 75th or 78th percentile in the country. 
And after we started this project, for the last 11 quarters, I'm proud to say we're between the 89th and the 94th percentile in the country. We're a county healthcare system. Also, the other metric I think that we can measure ourselves is as the number of people entering the work, workforce in healthcare is going down and more people are retiring and demand is going up, we're getting into a buyer's market, kind of like a housing market, a seller's market, kind of like a housing market. And so we have been really, my, my role also helps focus in on the team members and therefore retention. That means both physicians and and non-clinical support team members. And we went down from a 18.5% turnover rate to about 14 pre-COVID. So this has been our journey. And I look forward to, to discussing more. We've, we've, we've done some work on making sure that the people who don't need to be there should not be there crowding up the system. And we'd love to share that and see how we can leverage technology to improve the health for not only our patients, but also our care providers. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Vishal. Dr. Ravi. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for, for inviting me. I give you a little background on myself um, from Brooklyn, New York. So I'm a New Yorker, but currently in Philadelphia. I've been there. I went to medical school at Downstate, got both an MD and an MPH, a very strong interest in public health. Came down, went to residency at NYU, and then fellowship at CHOP. And like D the Dave, I am also in pediatric emergency medicine. I am both chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Holy Redeemer Health System. I'm also do shifts at some of the other local hospitals. But where it comes where it comes relevant to what we're talking today is Simplex. Simplex was started with my friend and co-partner David Rambo, who's got the business end, and I sort of have the medical end, because we saw a need that was not being met. In other words, a lot of chronic disease came back to what we considered lifestyle disease, and lifestyle disease is another way of saying. What you eat, what you do has a lot to do with your health down the road and all the complications and expenses that come with it. And nutrition probably accounts for almost 90% of your lifestyle health. And in general, nutrition is a cash-based business, small boutique, little places, not, not within reach to the general population. So we came up with an idea of bringing it to the general population through insurance base nutrition based on we can talk about this down you know when we get to that part but our goal was to bring nutrition to the masses to improve chronic disease lifestyle disease whether it's prevention or reversal of chron of certain disease chronic diseases and we've had quite a bit of success we started our company about five years ago with three people and we're reaching about 50 but more importantly is the you know the the success of the patients that we think we're doing or helping out as part of a team that are in health systems and doctor's offices. We play just an, another role of, of counseling nutrition. So thank you for inviting me and I hope to elaborate more as we get down to that slide. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Avi. And Mr. Margraf. Sure. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, it's really a privilege to join everyone this morning. Backgrounds are are sincerely humbling. The longer I, I'm in healthcare, the more the more naive I realize I am in so many different ways. So I'm I'm Blake. I founded the company Care Signal in 2015, and for the first two years of that business, we went about tackling the problem that resonated with the entire founding team, which is it's not for want of technology that most innovations don't make it to the light of day for real patients. It's for want of evidence. And Dr. Amen, it's exactly, I think, what you, what you emphasize, the, uh, the lack of incentive alignment. As we shift more and more to value, we've placed all of our chips on the concept that 
by uh, tying evidence and outcomes to financial returns that we could have a more compelling value proposition that would be adopted more rapidly by the market. And uh, I'm sure that I'll dive more into exactly what care sig signal is and does, but that's exactly what we did. So we, uh, we started by partnering with hundreds of clinicians ran more than 5,000 patients worth of uh, randomized controlled trials and studies and published really heavily showing that digital programs could drive outcomes equivalent to and in many areas superior to the currently available standards of care, whether they be devices or therapeutic pathways. So I'm excited to dive in. I think this will be a great discussion in the context of everything coming down the pipe, even, even over just the past few weeks as as round one of direct contracting kicks off. Tom, thanks again. Terrific. Thank you all. Well, just to set the stage a little bit more, all of these gentlemen are with firms that act as, you know, very compelling solutions in the healthcare space. But to, to I think, appreciate what they're doing, I think it always helps to, to take a step back and take a look at what the problem actually is. The best technology is ultimately solving a problem. So a couple fast facts that I think helped to outline the problem. Looking at the U.S. healthcare system from, from above, you see some pretty whopping numbers. First of all, it's a $3.6 trillion industry. On the right, you see how much of that $3.6 trillion accounts for uh, total G GDP. It's hovering about around 18% currently. It's the nation's largest employer. That $3.6 trillion industry equates to $11,000 per capita. And then the final bullets here, I think, is really, really telling. All of these wastes, unnecessary services, excessive admin costs, ineffectively delivered services, overpriced services, fraud, misprevention opportunities, those all amount to about a trillion dollars right there. These are actually old numbers from, I, I believe, 2013. So when I look at this problem in relation to value-based care, I see an opportunity for uh, kind of a, a fundamental sea change in, in how care is delivered that can begin to tackle some of these, these pressing problems in, in healthcare. So taking a step back, so what fee-for-service and value-based care are, I apologize, this is coming across as grainy on my end, but as, as was mentioned earlier, fee-for-service is more of the volume type of play as, as described on the left here and value-based is described on the right here. So fee-for-service, think traditional service that you, you have probably uh, encountered before many, many times where you go in to get a x-ray or you get some other imaging or you get a procedure done. Providers are paid for, are paid by the number of interventions that they do. So fee-for-service really think maximizing throughput and procedures regardless of value. On the provider side, they're very siloed. A lot of the money we talked about being wasted on the previous slide, think, you know, unneeded tests, duplicated labs, poor transfer uh, of records from patient uh, to doctor and between doctors. So siloed providers is kind of one of the symptoms of volume-based care. On the right side, you see value-based care. Uh, value-based prioritizes quality. And on the provider front, it incentivizes the provider to, to do the right care at the right time to keep the patient healthy. This is oftentimes very team-based. So duplication and interoperability, be it with you know technology or between teams, is very high. And the goal is not volume, but, but quality and health outcomes. They, there are you know, four established tenets of value-based care. There used to be three, and uh, I'm excited to talk about the fourth one. I know Vishal has great experience there, but it used to be population health, so keep the population healthy, keep patients healthy, drive down per capita cost, and increase the experience of care. We have since added another aim to, or another tenant to make it quadruple aim. So the, the one being added is the care team well-being. Is the provider team flourishing? You know, there's been a number of reports about physician burnout, physician suicide. 
obviously physicians can't do their job well and treat patients if they themselves are, you know, unhealthy and unhappy and, and, uh, and suffering. So the four tenets of value-based care, again, patient experience, obviously Im improvements in health outcomes or population health, reduction in costs and care team well-being. So there's a whole deep dive we could do on this slide, but I wanted to give some idea of how the value-based continuum looks from a, from a provider and a, and a uh, payer point of view, specifically in terms of risk and how these parties are paid. So this chart rationalizes value-based care by graphing risk and integration of parties. So you have risk on the, on the X or on the Y axis and, and uh, integration on the X axis here. So bottom left is fee for service. That's kind of business as usual. Then as you go up, you get more integrated and uh, more value-based types of payments. So the second two stairs there are kind of the pay for performance type of, of, uh, of payment. This is essentially still fee for service, but it's a redistribution from those who do poorly to those who do well. So you think about on, on the right-hand side, pay for performance takes into account value-based purchasing. So whether or not, you know, the patient has a high experience and other outcomes, you will be paid more or less based on those scores. Readmissions reductions. So if you have a readmission, for example, for a heart surgery, you will be docked money ultimately from the payers or if you if the patient gets a hospital acquired condition so it's kind of the same money same pool of money but it's being distributed to hospitals based on a net zero game whereby if you do well you you get more money and if you do worse uh, you get less money so going up the, the staircase a little bit you get to more risk riskier financial situations for the for both parties but ultimately more integrated and the the ability to get a little bit better care so you get you have bundled payments here where whereby providers are paid a fixed amount to treat a patient for a specific condition so these are lump sums for different different episodes of care just think for example a, a total joint replacement a doctors and care teams will get a lump sum for that episode of care and there are a number of those episodic you know types of indications or episodes that are that are quantified by or qualified by uh, CMS then finally you get up to more of the shared savings which is oftentimes capitation so providers are paid a fixed amount per patient per unit of time to treat a patient for all their conditions so this is uh, much closer to the to the kind of the ideal of the, the value-based spectrum. But the, the point is, is that, it, that it is a spectrum towards the, the, the bottom end of the value-based care spectrum. It's really closer and more akin to, to fee-for-service. So it's interesting, it will be interesting to continue to track kind of what, what revenue is derived from which type of value-based care. You know, many payers uh, are saying and touting that they are involved in value-based care. It's important to dig a little, a little bit deeper and, and figure out exactly what those terms are and, and how much they really are incentivizing uh, quality over fee-for-service. So this slide, I think, shows a, a proxy for the growth in, in, in value-based care. So this is growth in accountable care contracts over time. So as many of you know, accountable care organizations are networks of physicians, hospitals, and other providers that give coordinated high quality care. And CMS designed the program to ensure that patients receive the mo most appropriate care at the right time. So ACOs are basically a tool for, for value-based care. And as you can see, they've, they've done fairly well from a contract winning point of view over time. And I think their growth is, is a proxy, an imperfect proxy for the growth 
and adoption of value-based care. You know, a few other data points, as we've talked about with a couple of the panelists, you know, Aetna has said recently that they spend 75% of their spend on value-based care. Humana recently said that two thirds of its patients seeking care are in value-based arrangements. And then Kaiser Permanente is a great example of what they call a pay provider, where the, the, the payer and the provider are, are integrated. And ultimately that they push that spectrum all the way up into the right in terms of value-based care. But, so this is a, a slide that I think harkens back a little bit to the first slide where I talked about kind of the wastefulness in the, in the high, high GDP or high healthcare percentage of GDP. And I think it's a little bit more hopeful slide. So Deloitte came out with a report last year that basically uses the numbers in terms of projected growth of healthcare spend, but they said that that's overestimated. And the reason that it's overestimated is because you're, you're not taking into account technological advancement. You're not taking about, you're not taking into account the growth in, in data sharing and interoperability and in value-based care. So their, their report, which is, I think more in line with how we view the world is that there's a huge opportunity to bring down these projected costs with the help of tech, with the help of, you know, novel protocols in value-based care, with the help of biotech innovation, et cetera, to, to ultimately make a dent in those GDP numbers and get the spend down. So on that relatively more optimistic note, would love to get into some of our value-based care experts and hear what they have to say. So Blake, would you mind giving us an overview of, of what you're working on at CareSignal and, and, and some of the results you've had? My, my, my pleasure. And, and thanks, Tom. That's, I mean, it's, it's a hairy, hairy task to try to boil down all of the trends in healthcare to five minutes. And I think if I were sitting on a call about agriculture or food, I'd be <laughs> like, you, you really, you hit the perfect balance. So let's zoom out to 30,000 feet and talk about the IT stack that is around care signal and that I think is decently representative of a provider side IT stack, at least the big, big points. So at the top kind of upstream is the concept of population health, figuring out what is likely to happen to whom in what general time frame, right? It's, it's kind of just a super high level risk stratification and some groups are getting more and more granular, okay? Now downstream at the very end is the concept of telehealth or virtual care delivery. And I bet every single person on that call not only now knows about that, but has experienced that in some form or another over the past year. Okay, so you have what's happening with my population, what are the rough trends, and then how am I delivering care, which is really the core capability of providers. And what's missing is the puzzle piece in the middle, which is in a, in a, in a couple of words, remote monitoring. It's how do you keep tabs in a more granular way than retrospective data analysis of claims allows from a population health perspective? How do you keep tabs? on not just, not just a handful of individuals, but on thousands, tens of thousands of individuals that warrant that kind of monitoring longitudinally. And that's exactly where care signal fits. And that's exactly where I am to, to the greatest degree, even though it's a small degree qualified to speak a little bit about how that aligns with the shift to value-based care, right? The concept in remote monitoring is exactly as Tom summarized, that by investing in grabbing more frequent glimpses into what's happening for individuals over the long term, that you can just prevent bad stuff from happening. A cool, a cool stat here. So lots of different definitions, but if you define a rising risk individual as someone who who is immediately below the top 1% of utilizers, then literature have different, different outcomes, but, but the rough consensus is that rising risk population, that kind of two to 20% of the risk pyramid has about a 5% chance of bubbling up into high risk on any given month. 
and you say, great, okay, 5%, but how do you allocate resources to invest in cooling off that population? And I'll, I'll wrap up here by sharing that the approach that CareSignal takes is as a complement to the many, many different device-based monitoring solutions that exist, essentially capturing biometrics through wearables, through in-home monitoring suites. As a complement to that, CareSignal offers what we call deviceless remote patient monitoring. And the theory and thesis behind deviceless remote patient monitoring is that by asking patients in that 10 of, you know, tens of thousands of, of, of patient scale, the right questions at the right time, you can monitor with similar sensitivity and specificity and inform clinical outcomes that again, match and in many cases are superior to what, what different, much more expensive device-based monitoring approaches can achieve at scale for the long-term for that population. So I know that was, again, trying to boil the ocean there. Tom, where'd you like me to dive deeper? Yeah, I'm curious about, you know, from a payer perspective, talk to me about your relationships with payers and, and the distinction you've seen and are seeing versus CMS and, and some of the commercial payers and, and where you've seen adoption and where you've seen roadblocks. Absolutely. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an especially prescient question because, you know, of the now about 30 large organizations that CareSignal serves nationally, most of them, about 65, 70%, are large provider organizations. And of course, providers are de facto payers at the very least for their employees, right? But, but, but in terms of how we're working with, I don't think I can name. So we work with a couple of the techs of the, of the Aetna joint ventures as payers. And then we have, we have a bunch of others of the, of the top three. I think we have the big two and, you know, I think payers lack one thing and they know they lack it. And that is the relationship with the member, with the beneficiary. Whereas providers have a strong relationship and now are getting more and more into risk, payers recognize that the greatest threat they have, the thing that would really deliver on the disintermediation risk by providers is they've never managed to have a trusting, healthy relationship, for lack of a better word, with their members. Who likes getting a phone call from, you know, big name payer? So to answer your question, Tom, the way that we're tackling that is, is, is almost leaning on payers to see the opportunity for relationship arbitrage. Payers have the money. They can direct, at least to, to a great extent, the innovation, including innovations like CareSignal that can deliver these financial returns for them through clinical improvement. And if they agree to just go through the provider, leverage that provider relationship, they can avoid a whole lot of cost that would be incurred otherwise. Great. This is interesting, Blake. I want to come back with a few questions, but in the interest of, of time and getting to everybody, we'll defer some of those till the end, but thank you very much. Yep. Dr. Avi, same, same question to you. How do you, how do you rationalize Simplex's market positioning in relation to value-based care? Well, I think Far, as far as uh, population and uh, patients and sort of, uh, po you know, the, the, the available population that we serve is everybody. I mean, everyone can use nutrition, whether it's prevention or, or treatment. There are three general nutrition areas that, we, that, that are focused on. One is prevention. And each insurer has a certain amount of prevention visits. And based on the ACA, all prevention is deductible, copay free. So these are built into patients' benefits, but they don't know they have them. And while it may be impractical for a physician to spend an hour counseling a patient for a more reasonable price for an insurer and a payer, a physician can offset that conversation to a partner like us. So that's how we partner with on a larger level. There's two other possibilities. One is MNT, medical nutrition therapy. So you might have a diagnosis. You may have either used your prevention, but this is like a referral to PT. You get a referral, you try to approach it in a conservative manner rather than an expensive surgery or medication and see if we can make a difference. And then the last 
is gestational diabetics, a special population that has a great impact on a lot of lives, including the baby's life and the life there further. So those are the three sort of areas we focus we focus on. Now, as you can see in that circle, it's a it's a team approach. Even though we provide the nutrition, nutrition alone is nice, but it works when everybody's on board, the systems, the doctors referring us, the patients understanding the need for this, and then payers understanding the importance of nutrition and lifestyle medicine to decrease this, this overwhelming cost and increasing cost of chronic disease. So our goal is to align all this and to make it, especially using the prevention, make it free, essentially free for pretty much everyone because it's a built-in service that they're paying for, but don't know they even have it or use it. And so there's no copay for the patient. The physician doesn't take any loss in, in revenue. In fact, in value-based care, if their patient gets healthier, they take they get an indirect pro, uh, cost savings and more money and and for insurance payers to see that they could have an, a decreased cost on this chronic disease with a low cost intervention. Great. And what what sort of data do you think you need to, to level up with the with the payers for them to to onboard you more more across their their environment? And I think look at, you know, looking at Blake's, you know, slide and he, you know, all the randomized trials and publications they've done, we need that. The problem is from day one, we started seeing patients and we've had to build up over time. We collect the data, but we didn't have enough patients to actually run studies. Currently, we are engaging with academic medical centers to study either specific populations or populations as a whole to sort of have third party input as, you know, it's not just an industry provided study, but rather, you know, it's a study done through a third party in the academic center. I think that 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 would be a powerful thing to bring to provide to insurers and payers and even health systems. In other words, yes, everyone, there's lots of nutrition programs and everyone thinks they got it. Nutrition science is as vast and as controversial like, of anything you can think of. But if we say we have protocols, we show we institute them. This was the A1C, the blood pressure, the weight prior, and this is what it is after. And a year down the road, which is both a la you know a lasting impact because we've left them with education and understanding. That's something that would have a great impact on the patient when they join the insurer when they think about including us maybe as a more mainstream, perhaps providing more visits and the health system so bring us on to get that value based care savings. Great, Dr. Avi. Thank you. We'll come back uh, for more questions to you as well at the end. Vishal, thanks for joining us. You you come across you come at this problem in a in a different way. You know, working with with uh, large health systems and hospitals, specifically in the experience realm. You know, as we talked the other day, kind of distinguishing between value and experience. How do you how do you parse out the differences and and how do you relate the two, which is how is experience related to value and and uh, what are some of the the key kernels of wisdom you've uh, you've learned about experience for value at uh, Parkland and then soon to be Atrium. Well, thank you, Tom. So, you know, I know everybody has said this, but I think it needs to be repeated that. You, you, you get what you measure <laughs> and you're incentivizing, you know, so you, there's an incentive and therefore there are measures for those incentives and then people are working for those. But if the wrong thing is incentivized or not everything that needs to be incentivized is incentivized in the right priority, are you really making the difference that you intended to make? That's the question, right? And so <clears throat> what I did at Parkland 
what we did at Parkland and what I was able to help facilitate is really focus on an NPS equivalent recommend the hospital. Though though value based purchasing is based on rate the hospital, right? VVP is based on how do you rate your experience as a, as a hospital. I think will you recommend is is the key. The other piece that that because and I'll, I'll explain why. There are if we take VBP value based purchasing for our healthcare system, there are four parts to it, right? I don't know if if there's value in just it's just in just explaining that, but very briefly there are four parts to it. And one part is patient experience. That's only one part. The other part is is the clinical outcomes, and then safety and efficiency. And if you were to look at efficiency, right? You're, so so each of those four has a 25% weightage in how you get reimbursed. Okay. So the four are once again clinical outcomes, which is 25%. Age caps are patient experience, which is 25%. Safety is 25%, and efficiency is 25%. And without belaboring the conversation too much, for example, efficiency is only measured by one indicator, is your Medicare spend per patient. That's it. And that's 25% of the weighting. In terms of patient experience, there are seven measures that include plus rate the hospital, right? They're all around communication, whatever they are. But if you're only measuring and incentivizing based on the patients who are responding, so you have a sales mix or a, a patient mix of various socioeconomic and demographic backgrounds, okay? Just imagine that. So, so let us say 60%, and I'm just going to take an example. Let's say 70% of our patients are Hispanic, 50 plus age group, right? Let's say 70% of our patients are that, but not 70% of the people who responded to the survey are of that socioeconomic and demographic profile. Now we are actioning as a healthcare system, and if you layer it all the way up as a country, <laughs> we're, we're actioning based on the information we are receiving, we are not adjusting that based on the actual demographic profile of the number of people coming to see us, right? So if, if individuals are not necessarily uh, articulate in, in, in the language, either English or Spanish, or they are, some cultures are more clear in their needs, some are less, some are, you know, out of respect or whatever they may perceive, we're not necessarily fixing in the ratio we're not paying attention to the problems because we're not hearing it because their voice is not loud enough. We're not adjusting for that. We're not. And I think that is one, one part. The other part is the questions that are being asked. So, so the, while there are many, many questions being asked, we're, we're only incentivizing six questions. So we were able to move the needle at Parkland by focusing in on three of the six questions. Right? So... While it looks great on paper, and yes, we, we've improved, and overall patients are happier because there's a lot of correlation between what you work on and what the, the net effect is, but it's very, very important for us to review that are we measuring the right things, and then are we adjusting to, to fit our, our profile of the people that we serve in the communities we serve. And then the last thing I would talk about is adherence, and we've done a lot of work on that. And so there, there are many articles that show that one of the biggest issues facing healthcare and in that cost that you showed us on one of the graphs, you know, it would be interesting to see what, how many trillion of that is due to lack of adherence, right? And I, I'll, I'm going to go from the 30,000 foot level to an individual patient perspective again with a persona. And I keep bringing this up in terms of this persona. So again, let us say I'm a first generation, 60 year old Hispanic male who's a roofer, right? I'm a roofer. My provider doesn't know I'm a roofer. And so I have a con medical condition which my provider takes care of for me and gives me a prescription with some of a medication which is very effective, but that prevents me from working on the roof. Am I going to take that medicine? No, I'm not. But am I going to tell the provider that I cannot take this medicine? No, I'm not because 
he's a position of authority and I'm not, right? And I'll come to the solution next, but fundamentally what happens is I don't adhere to my care and then I end up in the ED, right? And that feeds the cost up. If we are able to enable the providers or the healthcare system to care for the whole person and understand the dynamics around the person, then if there was a medication which was 60% effective and the provider gave me that medication, but that allowed me to be on the roof, that allowed me to continue my profession and care for my family, I would definitely take it, right? And so there is this, this dynamic where people in healthcare are so aligned with the purpose of serving the person in front of them that if, if that person, they're doing everything they can, the provider is writing the medication, the partner is giving them the medication for free, but the person is not taking the medicine, that causes burnout in the provider. And they're like, why am I even doing this, right? And so adding that social aspect, what we did is we did two things, and this goes to Blake's point in terms of remote monitoring. So with, with COVID, also you had people with chronic care conditions who didn't want to necessarily come into the hospital setting. So we set up something called an RN clinic, and for some patients, we were able to get some remote monitoring equipment, but for others, we enabled it in, in their MyChart account, and so they were able to put in their vitals in the, in the MyChart, and the nurses would review them. We were able to set up thresholds so that if a patient is beyond that threshold, then the nurse calls them, and then they're calling them in, so it becomes a pull rather than... I have a routine visit every month I have to go see the doctor and we're filling our waiting rooms with people who don't necessarily need to be there. Meanwhile, there may be another patient whose cadence is different and they need to be there, but we don't know they need to be there. They don't know they need to be there, right? And so what we have done, we have now played it out in three clinics. We have RN-led clinics. So two things happen. One is that the patients are able to help input their data manually and the RNs, they have thresholds, and they're able to call the patient in as needed, and otherwise you're not needed to come in, keep up the good work. The second part is that if the patient comes in, the RN can spend more time with the patient face-to-face -face and get to know that Vishal is a roofer, right? And so RN is operating at the top of her license, seeing most of the patients and only escalating patients to the provider that need to be escalated. So the provider is also now operating at the top of their license. And so the social determinants of health are being assessed by the RN with a 40, 45 minute conversation, not a 15 minute conversation that the provider doesn't have time for. And so the volume to the provider has gone down, but it's more effective. And we are able to also show better healthcare outcomes for the populations who have signed up for the RN clinic. What is missing is incentivizing. And that's where the pairs come in. And it makes sense for the pairs. And I, know, I don't remember who talked about incentivizing. I think it was Avi. That if a patient is doing the right thing, we need to incentivize the patient. And again, go back to Vishal, the roofer, who has never had a massage in his life. If he was to bring his weight down by two kilos, we give him a massage. And now he's hooked. And then you can now start doing incentives that make sense to the individual and we can leverage technology on onboarding and uh, let's not get go down a rabbit hole but fundamentally it's about those creating those personas so what we do and i'm sure other areas do and as as entrepreneurs you're aware of the community health uh, assessments and so you know in which zip code what are the challenges and therefore you can have really targeted messages and targeted incentives in, a, in alignment with the value-based care. Thank you. Michelle, thank you. <clears throat> it's super interesting how interconnected all of these tenants are. And, you know, in, in my mind, that was an underappreciated. Many of these are underappreciated. And very interesting to see how, how turning some knobs one, in, in one tenant um, can drastically affect, affect others. So very cool work you're doing and, and wish you all the best at uh, Atrium next week. Last but certainly not least, Dr. Dave Amon from Privis Health. Dave, can you talk to us a little bit about what you're doing? In, in particular, you know, I'm, I feel like you're coming at this in a different angle than Simplex, for example, as they're starting with you know a, a chronic 
disease and and you have told me you're going a little bit more granular starting on a very focused acute or discrete condition and then moving outward from there can you can you talk to us a little bit what you're doing and 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 your your strategy for that sure yeah absolutely thank you tom and it's been also a pleasure to listen to all these subject matter experts and all of which i concur with and are in direct alignment with the work that we're doing so much of the work that Privis is doing today, <laughs> sadly, is based on past failures, where we've learned a lot. They say you learn more from your failures than your successes. That's absolutely true in my case. I, I take us back to the work I did in the accountable care organization, where a very large focus was on taking care of the, the, the whole person and, and thinking about the risks of for example, delivering chronic care management. And so I want to speak to a fundamental of the work that we're doing, which is one of the reasons that value-based care has had a stumble or two, especially in the, the system or provider space, is that we, we all dove into this. And certainly I did when I was on the healthcare administration side without a very clear understanding of what our risks were. So it's one thing to say, we're going to go at risk. And it's a quite another to say, okay, well, if you're going to go at risk, what is the risk of your population? We didn't know back in the day. I'm not sure that we do a great job at that <clears throat> today. And then even beyond the risk of a particular population, when I think about population health management, we get singularly discreet and we say, what is the risk for a particular individual? So, so, Tom, when you say we've taken a, a discrete approach, to it, we've taken a, a discrete approach to this in, in two ways. And so, number one, <clears throat> the start of our philosophy and process <clears throat> is, that, is that artificial intelligence or machine learning, uh, AI, big data, whatever you want to call it, largely is, is a, a technique that hasn't had a great use case in healthcare, at least not in my experience today. We're still struggling with what does that mean? So we took the point of view that what if we could take risk stratification of patients to another level? What if we could develop a personalized risk stratification plan for every patient? Let me cite an example. If, if I'm CMS, I'm going to look at two heart failure patients that both have diabetes <clears throat> exactly the same. So they're going to get a risk score, risk adjustment factor, HCC uh, score that is going to be additive based on historical actuarial data. And yet the reality is those two patients look wildly different if you sit down and look at where the risk is for each one of them. One patient may have great social support, a great medication compliance, great supplemental insurance coverage. The other patient may uh, live alone, live in a food desert, not have supplemental insurance, wind up in the donut hole of CMS and not be able to afford their medications. That presents a far greater challenge uh, they are two wildly different patients. So, so we are using our platform to actually do that personalized risk stratification. We can take in claims data, clinical data, great. That is not the entire story. We'll look at social determinants. We'll take in external data sources like CDC's Social Vulnerability Index. We've even started uh, tinkering, around, tinkering around the edges of incorporating consumer purchasing patterns. There's a world of data out there that if it is processed and the right clinical questions are answered, has the ability to create a personalized risk profile for every patient down to the patient level. That can also be rolled up and you can look at cohorts of patients. That's what I call next generation risk stratification. That is far superior to just looking at two heart failure patients that both have diabetes and say their risk is X because we know it's not. <laughs> and that's where part of the failure of the, the risk profiling within you know, conventional value-based medicine lies. So once you can quantify risk, I think it follows that you then need to be able to take action against it and you need to be able to mitigate it. And if you can do that at a discrete level or at the patient level, you've got a fighting chance of, of actually managing that patient's utilization and keeping them healthy, which is the goal at the end of the day, which is the same as keeping utilization low. So that requires a technology infrastructure that actually allows you to mitigate the risk. So we've heard a lot of these techniques today, remote, whether it's remote patient monitoring uh, or whether it's advanced communication with a patient, virtual first, 
you know, simple things like texting. And so developing that technology infrastructure that lays out a care plan for this patient over some period of time or some discrete episode becomes unbelievably important. And that care plan, you know, who needs the remote monitoring? It's probably not every patient where they all need something a little different. So being able to tailor that to their unique risk profile becomes unbelievably important. And so there's many techniques and you've heard a lot of them today about that technology infrastructure that comes into play. Then the question is, does technology alone solve the problem? No, I'm gonna pause it. If it did, we would have solved the problem. Technology doesn't truly care for people. People care for people, for human beings. So we, we can't lose sight of the human touch where patients feel like they're engaged both with their providers, they're engaged with the system. I think somebody's referenced that nobody truly feels engaged to their payer, probably not. But restoring trust and building the relationship with their provider or health system is unbelievably important. That leads to a question of scale. How do you do that? Well, I could assign some person to sit with this patient 24 hours a day. That's neither scalable nor financially feasible, but I can use technology uh, to increase that reach. We can use, you know, asynchronous messaging. We can use remote monitoring. I think that Blake spoke too to actually set off alarms. When people start to depart from the guardrails, we know it ahead of time. This is proactive care, not, not retrospective care. It's about anticipating and then monitoring and keeping patients within the guardrails. So we never lose sight of that scalable touch, or we shouldn't. We should strive to, to use technology to make that outreach scalable. The last thing I would mention is that one of the challenges value-based medicine has had is boiling the ocean. It, it, we, we started our journey in the realm of chronic care management. Wow, it's hard for our payers, providers, it's even hard for CMS, I would su suggest sometimes to get their heads wrapped around, what does that actually look like? That's a, a, a monumental task. This global care that encompasses just about everything that could be wrong with a patient. We haven't seen a lot of enthusiasm for that. What we've seen a lot of enthusiasm for, however, from both payers and, and well, from payers, employers, and in some respects, providers, is can you drill down into something a little more discreet that we can get our heads wrapped around? So let's get back to bundles for a moment. Okay, so a 30, 60, or 90 day bundle. Wow, this process I just laid out has to have a fighting chance of ensuring a better clinical outcome, which in effect drives cost in addition to quality and patient experience for that matter. We've also uh, had a lot of traction in uh, the payer space coming to us and saying, can you do this, but just prove your point with our heart failure patients? Absolutely. Well, as a clinician, I would tell you that the heart's connected to the lungs, is connected to your diabetes, is connected to everything else, right? So, so we're, we're happy to entertain the idea that we can go down a disease-specific pathway. What we've also heard from the payer space is, wow, if you can do it with heart failure, can you do it with diabetes? Could you do it with COPD? So we're looking at these discrete pathways that we all know at one point will converge uh, because it's a similar process. It's just a different pathway and there's a little bit of overlap there, but we've stopped speaking about globally taking care of people, even though we know that that's unbelievably important. And we've started speaking a little more along the lines of, you know, give me something that's discreet and you can get your head wrapped around, we can get our arms wrapped around, we'll go quantify the risk associated with each one of these patients, we'll go tackle that using this technology infrastructure. And that seems to have gotten a, uh, a, a pretty enthusiastic welcome. The last thing I would mention to the group here and to the folks listening in the audience, we've also taken a really hard look at the horizon of our customer. It's unbelievably important because if I, if I go to a payer and I say, this is good for your patients 10 years from now, that's a non-starter because at that point, quite likely that patient is on another plan and somebody else reaps the reward of that. So we have to provide a, a, an ROI essentially that is within the horizon of our customer, whoever that may be. Payers have a different horizon Within the payer community, Medicare Advantage plans, uh, I would speak to Humana, have yet a different horizon than commercial. Medicaid has a different horizon still. And then in the 
the uh, provider space, uh, they have their own horizon they're working with. I mean, let's face it, doctors don't want to lose their panel. I mean, they're not looking to keep patients for a year or two. They're looking to keep them for a lifetime or as long as they can maintain that relationship successfully. And so we, we, we take that focus on horizon very seriously. And when we're, when we're pitching an ROI to somebody, that, that has to be a consideration. So I'll pause there. I, I just unloaded a whole lot and gave you an inside look at what Privis does. And, and I'll pause and take any questions. No, that's great. Thank you, Dave. I know we're pushing up against time. If you have to jump, no worries, either panelists or attendees. We might push on with some stragglers here for a minute, but we have a couple questions from the audience, but, but real quick, just while I'm thinking about it, Dave, and I think it's a question for everybody, you know, from a payer perspective, you mentioned risk stratification as kind of uh, a key obstacle that needs to be removed. You know, curious from, from the other folks on the, on the panel, what you think the biggest obstacles are both from a payer onboarding and from pro provider onboarding to get, you know, we're talking about ACOs as a proxy up or, or other proxies for value-based care across the country up. What, what are those? Well, I think part of it, if I had to say, is that a lot of providers are saying, oh, another help way of changing things, more paperwork, more administrative tasks, more of another thing. We've heard HMOs, ACOs, we have our MIPS. And so it's like another acronym. And then, you know, the, the question worries, well, what if my patient doesn't do what they're supposed to do and I lose out on that and my business depends on the outcomes of my patients that I may have some control, but not full control based on my population. And that would be an obstacle for, for everything for, for the provider, for an insurance company. It's again about the horizon. They have a shorter horizon than the physician's horizon. The physician's horizon may say, listen, if I get this person to live a better quality life and a healthier life and a longer life over the course of my having them as a patient, I feel like I'm, I, I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm making success. Payer may say, did I make my return in a year? Because that's a typical policy. And so with people jumping policies, they want to know short-term gains. And the physician's really focused on more overall healthy long-term gains. And so that would, that's an obstacle that I've come across. Tom, Tom, I'm happy to dive in too. Agree with everything Avi said, and it's it's a question of you know adoption. When I think about the, you know, the obstacles to risk stratification, you know, I think it goes without saying that interoperability is obviously an obstacle, which may be going away here in July or maybe getting more complicated. I'm not sure anybody's really sure yet. But certainly the interoperability integration, and and I think the 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 relative lack of understanding on the part of, of, and I, I don't want to pick on the payers here because I'll pick on all parties, the relative lack of understanding of what machine learning is capable of doing. We haven't seen it directly applied in many respects to this. We're starting to, but we're still conventionally doing things the old way. Let's go look at our claims data, which is a 90 day retrospective look back. What is that telling us? Well, that's not even coming close to telling you what you need to know. If it, if it were, uh, we would have had far more success than we're than we're, than we're having. And so, so while interoperability is one thing, it's also the open mind which says, what other data sets can we pull in? And what data science teams with a life sciences focus can we pull in? What clinical questions do we need to answer? And then how do we groom these, these algorithms using these external data sets to tell us what we think we want to know or generate insights? It's not always obvious where, where a risk, a four or five risk for the patient will pop up. So we're not there. It, that's in its infancy, but there, it's, it's, it's getting a lot of attention. Interoperability will help, but the, the fundamental understanding that machine learning can be far superior if it's applied properly than, than conventional actuarial tables based on you know historical outcomes is, is probably an obstacle too. I think there needs to be more education and more demonstrated success. Again, nobody, nobody believes in science fiction. Nobody's willing to bet a dollar 
if unless they're absolutely sure they can get a dollar twenty five out of it on the ROI side. So it, it, it'll it's a it's a it's a challenge. It's a good challenge. And there's a lot of really smart folks doing doing work in this area. So it, it'll come. I would like to add one perspective to your question. We've talked about payers and providers. Let's also consider the perspective of the patient. <laughs> sure, and please. I think the biggest the biggest hurdle barrier is trust. We're asking them to change behavior fundamentally, whether it's so there are two parties. There's the care provider party and the patient. And the patient is also has to be equally, if not more than 50% responsible for their health. And so in order to enable that, we need to enable changing of behavior. That's what we're talking about for everything that we have discussed today. And in order for that, there has to be trust and there has to be relationships. So I, I, I request you, all the entrepreneurs, please consider that trust and building that relationship on a one-to-one -one level mm -hmm. so that all of this will be scaled up. I think that that is that is key. And the other thing that I just wanted to mention, <clears throat> which and Tom again, thank you for the quadruple aim slide. And remember, we talked that whatever is incentivized is worked on and measured. What's not incentivized is not measured. So while caring for the care team, the well-being of the care team is in the quadruple aim. Neither is it measured, nor is it incentivized. And therefore, nothing is done about it except lip service. And I'm sorry, I'm a little passionate about it, but I think uh, if we don't do that, so, so you have the patient and you have the care provider, right? The two parties fundamentally at, that's where the rubber meets the road. If the care provider is burnt out and the patient does not have trust, that's where we are at. And the solution is to please consider that relationship of both the, the, the care provider's flower blooms when he sees the patient do well, and the patient does well when they can trust the care provider. So I think that is something I would just request you all to consider in your development. And you can definitely leverage AI, you know, coming from healthcare, the CRM systems, personal, you know, likes, dislikes, and what drives me, what doesn't drive me, right? There are, there are many avenues and, and that, that that can be leveraged, including voice bots or stuff like that. But anyways, thank you. Great, thanks for that, Michelle. Looks like we have one question from the audience and then, then we'll go on our ways here. But Jerry Dowell asks, what does the integration look like between the federal and state governments as states look to shift at least the Medicaid systems over to value-based care? Someone wanna take a crack at that? That's a, that's a that's a that's a beast of a question. I mean, it's going to depend on the state. It's going to depend on a lot of the federal policy that's in pipeline, literally right now. I I would, it's kind of a cop out, but I would say a lot of that depends on the sentiment of the employers. After all, you know, a lot of dollars and outcomes are controlled. The herd of dollars and outcomes, at least, are controlled on that side. Yeah, Tom, I'm, I'm glad to put together thoughts for the person who asked that question and share some resources if that's of interest. I can, I can take a crack at it a little bit just based on some current experience, Tom. It's, it's, it's a great question. And one of my great passions is what I view as the un, under, underserved population or in some cases non-served. And we know that Medicaid is exactly that. And we've had Medicaid expansion. We've had states. I live in one that's not a non-Medicaid expansion state. And historically, what's been done with Medicaid is state or, you know, state Medicaid has contracted with with the payer space to deliver some kind of an HMO solution, solution which is not value based care. It's in many ways just cost containment and, and doesn't deliver the promise of true, true care to the patients. Certainly not in any what we would expect from a commercial or even a Medicare or and certainly not an MA plan. We have gained some traction most recently with, with a uh, Medicaid plan. And again, I'm gonna go back to discrete states. The Medicaid population is unbelievably complicated for a variety of reasons. Socioeconomic status, number one, job hopping, inter interstate movement, going from one plan to another. When we talk about horizon, now we've talked about something far even, even 
somewhat more restrictive. However, it is interesting that a state Medicaid plan reached out to us and said, what can you do for our heart failure patients within a 12 to 18 month horizon because they're killing our bottom line. And again, if we consider horizon and we consider a discrete pathway of care, we, we have a really good chance at affecting something very positive for these patients over that timeline. Now, can I change the rest of their 20 years? I, I, I probably can't uh, unless we do manage to connect with them in that 12 to 18 months and it's an amazing experience and we manage to build that trusting relationship that Vishal talked about or rebuild it where it's woefully lacking in the Medicaid system. I think we'd all agree. If we manage to do that, you know, leveraging technology is one thing, but but in, always inserting that human touch in it to make sure patients feel like they're cared for. Hey, if, if we can satisfy the plan in 12 to 18 months that we've saved them money, if we can connect with the patient in a meaningful way, that's at least a start. And it's a great question that somebody asked, and it, it shouldn't be lost to any of us that I've often said, if you can, if you can crack the nut on, the, on Medicaid, everything else looks easy by comparison. And I'll hop onto that because Tom, in one of your slides, when you looked at adoption of value-based care, Medicaid was literally almost flatline. Yeah. And dealing personally in our in our company with payers, which we deal with all payers, because our go our mission is to bring nutrition services to everybody, regardless of socioeconomic, regardless of insurance, etc. I would say that we've had the most difficulty with certain managed care Medicaids in the sense that they're not seeing nutrition as a valuable therapy. You know, obviously, again, we don't have yet the data, but we will, but we're not even given the door to say, this is a service that is worth a try for you. Maybe we'll pilot, see a thousand of your patients. So the Medicaid population is, is what we need the most to hit but they're the hardest to get through if we want to do our mission of not charging the patient, which is which for those populations would be detrimental and impossible and have Medicaid pay for it because that their incentive is to keep costs low. And while yes, they're doing some version of value-based care, at least look into lower cost options to improve the, the you know the, these expensive chronic care patients and they're a hard nut to crack and i think davy said it best if you get medicaid on board i mean you know you, everyone else is going to follow or i mean usually medicaid follows everybody else but you will have gotten everyone else to follow and they they're they're, they're it's a difficult it's a difficult pair to deal with and there's a lot of managed cares in, in, in one state alone, let alone many different states. And they all got their own philosophies and they all got their own agendas. And it, as opposed to commercial or even Medicare, it, these are, these, this is a pair that you, know, you have to fight for. The one thing I just wanted to add briefly is you have the federal, you have the state, but also please do not discount the county. Because the counties, uh, like in Dallas, you know, the, the, the county taxes its residents to care for those that are not necessarily covered all through by the, between the state and the federal. Terrific. Well, I've kept you all later than I said I would, so I apologize. But thank you for your willingness to uh, keep the conversation going. This has been uh, fantastic from my point of view. I hope it uh, has been for you as well and it uh, spawns some, some, some new friendships or new collaborations. To those in attendance, uh, we host these calls every uh, month, the second Wednesday of the month at 9 a.m. Central, uh, and we alternate between a topic in food and ag and healthcare. So look out for next month's topic on food and or agriculture. And we hope to, to speak with you before that, but to hopefully see you at that webinar as well. So thank you all for your time again, and, and have a wonderful Wednesday. Thank you.